Hi, Lydia. Thank you so much for joining Future Fridays. It's always a pleasure to interview really future thinking, especially women in the space. And you are definitely one of them with everything that you've been doing with Planner, um, the way that you've been an, an educator and supporter and um, really, you know, deeply involved in hedge funds, investment management, private assets, and the way that people can use insights to, to drive better decision making. So I'm so grateful to have you here today to share your story. And I'd love if you could kick us off of where are you based right now and what are you working on these days? Well, thank you so much, Alanda, for having me. I'm so delighted to be on the show today. So I'm calling you from New York. I'm originally from London, um, but I moved over to New York earlier on this year. So um, I'm currently in New York, very excited to um, look at the scene and what is happening um, within the city. So currently we're working on Planner, as you mentioned earlier on, and Planner is designed to accelerate the decision-making process of financial um, executives, financial investment executives. Uh, and what that boils down to is doing something very cool within generative AI space, matching that with predictive AI and helping all that data that we work on, you know, helping the teams to get plain insights very, very quickly. Um, that sounded like a, a bit of a, a pun there, but, but but really that is the essence of what we are doing, right? Um, you saying that, you know, generative AI to make things very, very quickly and simply for, for investment executives. I think the visualizations and the simplicity that you're build, building into this space is enormous and so useful. Um, I'd love to know and have you share more about the story of how you got here, right? Obviously, AI has been emergent and becoming more and more relevant um, more recently, but you have also a pretty extensive background in the more sort of traditional space and institutional investing space. So how did you get from more traditional financial management all an analysis into now generative AI? So I actually started you know, way back, you know, some 20 years ago um, in the industry on the traditional side, as you mentioned. So my first job was um, with a company called Aberdeen Asset Management, now called Aberdeen. And, and I think what drew me into financial and investment management overall was the fact that, A, I was very interested in, you know, helping people manage money, manage their wealth in a very much more concisive and systematic way. Um, drawn to that industry from day one. And so all my courses at university, I schooled in Aberdeen in Scotland, all the courses were towards that, you know, towards the direction of me working in the industry. So I, Aberdeen Asset Management, Aberdeen was my first job as an investment analyst. And I really, really enjoyed the experience. Um, after that, I joined a hedge fund back in London, and I guess the, the rest continue on joining um, Fidelity and another private equity hedge fund shop called Unigestion uh, before I left corporate in 2015. But ultimately, as an investment analyst, I think although I enjoyed their work so much, I guess one of the things that became very much more obvious to me was the amount of data that we sit down and scrape through all the time. And look, there's so many hours in a day, 24 hours in a day. Our, our bodies have got a circadian rhythm whereby, you know, we can't, we cannot be up the whole 24 hours, right? So you do that consistently over and over again, you get, you start getting tired. Um, when I left corporate in 2015, 2015, 2016, I, I formed my first company in 2016 and here doing similarly what I was doing within corporate, but then the task of that investment analyst um, role, i.e. analyzing information or analyzing companies, markets, and, and aggregating that to form a concisive overview um, for one to understand the direction of travel with markets and companies itself became very, very laborious. And so one day I was thinking, you know, sitting down behind, you know, my computer, just a little bit annoyed, my, I, I, you know, at myself, very frustrated about what I was going through and thought, surely there must be some technology out there that can help me to quickly synthesize all this data, help me to see exactly very, very quickly what is happening when it comes to understanding the duration of market travel, number one, and two, with, within the companies, uh, with the portfolio, helping me to sort of, you know, see very clearly what is happening within the companies without me sitting down and pouring my eyes over the, um, a vast amount of data. So out of frustration, I started investigating technologies out there in the market that could help us do that. 
And then I guess the other thing that became very much more um, um, sort of, you know, um, prominent is the fact that it's not as if, you know, the industry is not using technology. The industry is using technology. Machine learning is nothing new um, to the industry. But when it comes to unstructured data, what do we do with, with news flow? How do we extract that insight from news flow, from articles, all of that information, uh, you know, if, if, to, to help us quantify what is happening very, very quickly. That wasn't present at the, at the time. So we're thinking about 2019 around this time of, of my story. Um, so I sort of, you know, bugged down, put my head down and started looking at, number one, as an analyst, I'm very deep down. So I go, first of all, with research materials. So sort of looking through all these research papers, um, available at that time. And I came across what Dublin have written about that um, program. So this is the BED program. It's an open source program that was issued by Dublin, who I think he's still working at Google by that time he, he, he was working at Google. So that piqued my interest, um, you know, using that technology and architecture to analyze unstructured data. Uh, but of course, I'm a non-technical person. I didn't start my career in technology, right? So with that insight, I started reading more papers around the subject, and I came across you know, Open AI. I also wrote about, obviously, ChatGPT at the time, and 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 so comparing those two methodologies, those two, those two um, architectural environment, I was like, okay, maybe we can do something here. Maybe I'm gonna try and replicate at this, but I want to go a bit further because. The architecture is available and anybody can apply to whatever they want to um, use it for. But then to make it much more applicable to the industry, you do need to have what in the industry. You have to have had that domain expertise for whatever you're doing for it to make sense. And so therefore, with my strong domain expertise, I then had to work out the technology question. How am I going to solve this from a technology perspective? So then I got in touch. You know, I formed a partnership with a data scientist and we started drilling down into the problem and and I guess the rest is history and we're here now. I love that and then you've built like amazing supporters of um, like NVIDIA and their inception program and Microsoft for startups like that's such a massive thing to have behind you. You know um, it was a very interesting um, you know discussion that initially we we, uh, we had about the NVIDIA for in, uh, NVIDIA inception program for startups because again this is always you know everything that I talk about is you're gonna have to start somewhere and once you start you can you know you, you find out that the doors start opening up for years so through our investigation we started doing developing algorithms, instead of sort of working on the prob problem, and eventually we landed onto NVIDIA. And it happens that actually there's a whole lot of resources available to us to help us go to the next level. Um, and, and we're still part of the program, right? So NVIDIA, as you know, one of the biggest, you know, uh, infrastructure, all the busy, biggest technology companies provide infrastructure for um, the training of, uh, you know, um, large language models. So, you know, we, we applied to the program, we got accepted. That was a real boost of confidence to me. Um, and then and then we started using some of the technology there. And, uh, and then um, another opportunity arose with Microsoft for startups, where we again, we applied again, look, I'm, I mean, I'm just gonna like sharing my dream here. It's not as if I started in technology at all. And, and it became very obvious to me very, very quickly as we got accepted into these programs that clearly there was a huge need for what we do and had a huge opportunity as well for what we, you know, the solution that we're providing to the market. And what advice would you give to somebody getting started, especially knowing, um, you know, everything that you know now and being this really high intensity domain expert, but not feeling like you had the technical um, resources that you needed to make that vision a reality? What did that actually look like to find, you know, your technology team and resources to get to where you are today? You know, the advice that I'll give to anybody who in a similar shoe as I, I was back in the day was you have to start somewhere. You have to tell your story, put yourself out there. And you're definitely going to make what I call mistakes, but it actually I've, I've, I've reframed that term mistake to learning paths. 
um, you know, it's a stepping stone for you. It's an experience for you in, in your life as you kind of build your company. Don't be scared that you don't know the technology, the technologies within technology, because you will learn everything that you start doing, start with you not knowing a lot about it. If we if we go back to the time that we went to university, we had no knowledge about the courses that we were going to take or the subject matter that we we're going to take. We just went from A levels to a big subject, right? But we learned and we became experts. So in the same and similar manner, when you start, don't be scared that you don't have that technology technology background, just stick out yourself out there and, and, and start exploring, right? But you have to understand, obviously, the technology that you, you want to apply to your problem. I took I sat back and started off from that. I need to know what's going on. So reading the research papers, um, so that at least I've got a bit of knowledge as to what is happening before I looked out for, you know, a technology team. And, and when you come to building out your technology team, look, there are so many, you, there are so many teams and type of technologies out there. You're going to have to try a few. Your first one is not going to be the one that's going to stick with you till the end of, of your business or when you sell your business. But you have to be open that things happen along the journey. And again, as I say, learning experience, you become much more expert as you go along. But you have to be open and try you know, the teams and try different people until you get to the right mix. But Overall, I guess the core message is don't be scared. You have to take the first step. You have to share your dream. You have to discuss your dream with people. And people will buy into it, and you'll be surprised how much support you would get from the community. And so now that you've read all these research papers, you've been spending these multiple you know, hours and days on building the project that you are in this generative AI landscape. What are you thinking about in the future? Where, where do you think this is going? Whether it's like the good, the bad, or the ugly. Obviously, there's so many debates around generative AI, but what is um, really inspiring you that you feel like is your unique insight about where the future might be going that you'd want to share? Um, very, very good question. Um, I think within the whole generative AI space, there are a couple of things that stick out to me. I feel like we should treat it as a means one end, you know, um, it is not the end in itself. It is the step, the thing that will get us to the end. Um, there are so many people coming out with a lot of, you know, applications on top of, you know, the actual infrastructure. I feel like the space is now being carved out very nicely. That the ones that are developing the infrastructure, that the ones that are training models, and that the ones that are building applications to it. Um, from my perspective, if you're applying the technology to a space, for example, in my case, financial services, it really does help if one have worked in the industry before, have actually gone through some of the problems before, because then you can sort of you know, create or recreate that logic that a human being would go through in solving that particular problem using the technology. It becomes very difficult if one doesn't have that domain expertise because then it becomes like another tooling, um, you know, technology that um, one is working on. But we already have so many of the bases already. We don't need to replicate that. Um, in the future, within the financial services industry, I see generative AI and AI overall um, being like working as a core pilot to the human intelligence. I do not feel that you know, AI, whatever kind it is, is going to replace the human being at all in everything that we do. I feel it's actually going to help us reduce some of the manual tasks that we endure as human beings in our you know day-to-day -day lives. But the human intelligence is so much that humans we have, you know, accumulated over the years. Um, you know, in addition to the data, the raw data, the emotional aspect becomes also very, very important as well. So the human being have got a lot of intelligence. However, the human being is limited on time. Human being is limited across the amount of data that one can consume. And so I see the future being a partnership of AI and human intelligence working hand in hand to solve the problem. So that end goal. In, in which case the generative AI space or the generative AI application or tool becomes an enabler for the human being to achieve the optimum sort of state, if you will. 
I don't know if that sounds too futuristic or too out there, but I'm, I've got a strong belief that a lot of people are talking about human beings being replaced, but I feel it's more like co-pilot and working hand in hand to get to the ultimate goal. I love that word co-pilot. I think that's a, a great way to kind of summarize it. And I'm curious what's inspiring you in this space. Like, what do you feel like are the people or the projects or the companies that are really on the cutting edge that you look to uh, and say, wow, that's really interesting. So one of the companies I really, really do admire is Hug and Face. Um, it's a portal for open, open, uh, open source technology uh, to make it possible for anyone to get get their hands on some of these open source large language models and create their own, own algorithms on it. So good resource, good company. I love how they've grown. I love how they're moving. Um, there is also another company that we love, 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 Haystack. They're a young company in itself, but again, they're providing roles for companies like ourselves to develop the products that we develop, and they're growing really fast, and they've done something really, really um, sort of, you know, um, useful within the whole ecosystem. I think these two companies, we're going to have to watch out for them uh, within the technology space. Apart from that, generally, in terms of people that inspire me, I know I know people are going to shoot me down for this, but someone like Ellen Musk, I really, really love Ellen um, for the fact that he's very visionary. He's gone beyond, um, you know, what people thought he would go, uh, the extent that people thought he would go to, um, his ability being very, very resilient and, and, and sort of, you know, pushing through is very, very inspirational. I, I take a lot of strength from him. So, I love it. For better or worse, he's definitely pushing the edge. So people <laughs> love to hate him and love to love him. So I mm -hmm. love that. It's a, it's a great call out. And how about your project? I would love to just um, hear a bit more about it. Like who is your target person? If somebody's listening right now, who can this help? What use cases are really standing out? And then ultimately, how do we follow the advances as you evolve this project in the future? And then you as well as a, as a founder. Sure. Um, I think, you know, the problem that we sought to solve was to help when we think about financial executives. So within the wealth management space will be the relationship manager and the portfolio manager. Um, my brother is a wealth manager and and sometimes they, they are, his frustration become my frustrations <laughs> at some point. And you can see how, you know, most of their workspaces are not really cohesive, which makes their whole job very, very laborious. I mean, there are some statistics out there that was published by McKinsey at some point. It explains that about 70% of the time that relationship managers spend with their work is not actually managing portfolios, but it's more like an administrative task. So, so with our platform, end-to-end -end platform, yes, we've created a means to the end. We, we're training the, you know, the large language models, combining that with traditional um, predictive AI models to create, to make intelligence much more quickly to assess. It helps the um, portfolio manager, it helps the relationship, man relationship manager to get that insight around the companies in their portfolio very, very quickly. It reduces that time that is spent on this um, for, for, for them. And, and in addition to that, we've created a platform dashboards that help them to, if we think about the individual's portfolio, it helps them to see what is happening within your portfolio very, very quickly when we integrate the intelligence that we're generating within your portfolio, right? So, <clears throat> so the whole end-to-end -end solution, the means to the end and the end itself is created for the financial executive to help better serve the, uh, the, the end customer. In terms of how you can follow me, I'm on or follow our work, obviously, planar.io, P-L-A-I-N-R.io, um, go onto our website, support what we're doing, um, get in touch with us. We love to discuss our product with you in more depth. Uh, I am on LinkedIn a lot, uh, so I'll leave you for you on LinkedIn. Um, I'm sometimes, um, you know, on Twitter as well. Uh, I put my Friday inspirations on Twitter, so I'll leave you for it. You can find me there too. But we, we, we are looking for the community to support us. Um, so, you know, do share our work, do share our tweets, do share our posts on LinkedIn and let us know if you want us to discuss what we're doing in more depth with you. I love that, Lydia. We'll definitely be following along, especially your journey. Just such an inspirational founder with, you know, such deep expertise in the space and now really moving into this new frontier. And uh, I so appreciate the work you're doing. I'm really excited to see 
how it grows. Well, thank you so much for having me. I hope you've been able to inspire some of the women that are listening to us. It's, it's definitely not easy, but you know, we women, we're very strong, we're very resilient. There's nothing that we cannot do when we set our mind to it. So I encourage everybody who's thinking about going on this path to just, you know, do it, basically, just do it. <laughs> just do it. What a great finale. Thank you so much. Get out there, just do it. Thank you, Alana. Thank you, everybody.